Okay, we got a vocabulary in Texas that's very simple. When we say yes, we say uh-huh. <laughs> and when we say no, we say uh-uh. Do we have any good listeners? Everybody say uh-huh. Uh-huh. So let's do 10, 10 times. Let's go. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. All right? What's an aluminum key made out of? Uh-uh. We want everybody to participate. This is nothing to embarrass you. You can't get it wrong. So let's go. Let's do the word hope 10 times. Let's go. Hope, 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 hope. Come on. Hope, 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 hope. All right? What's the right part of the air call? Yo. 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 It may be the shell. It may be the white part, but it's certainly not the yoke, amen? <laughs> now, the only way we can not have fun is you don't communicate. We need everybody. We got enough people in here when we say this for everybody to sound off and have some fun today. How many just like to shop in here? Oops. Some of us like to shop till we drop, right? <laughs> so let's do shop in town. Let's go. Shop, 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 shop. What if we do the green light? Story 
at nine years of age that he became the governor of Tennessee. For the first time in his life, he saw himself as he really was. God's child, created in God's own image. And he began to, to unleash the incredible potential that we all have within ourselves. David understood that. And that's why he wrote Psalms 139 and send your hand out. Let's read that together. Psalms 139 and 14 says, I will praise you, Lord God, because I am fearfully and what wonderfully made. Marvelously miraculous are your works. And the most important part says, and that my soul, my inner winner, knows it right well. Do I have anybody that knows that you were fearfully and wonderfully made by God? That you were created in God's own image a little lower than the angels? You were born to win. You were engineered with God's excellence. You have been endowed with God's seeds of greatness. And God expects great things from us while we're here on earth. Do you know that you were in your mom's womb for nine months as God was preparing for you to come to earth? And all that was was preparation time. And just like you were in the womb for nine months, you are here, according to Genesis 6 and 3, for 120 years or less to prepare you for eternity either with God or with the enemy if you don't know who you are and whose you are. And doctors tell us that we have a seven million to one chance of getting here. All those sperm were chasing one egg. You were the only one that made it. You were the only one God chose for you to be here. He selected you out of seven million to come because he believed in you and he believed that you would help him help Jesus redeem a lost world and God wants everybody to understand that you have been created by God and God doesn't make any junk and he certainly doesn't make any extra and everybody born in this world was selected by God and you have a reason for being here. But most of us, instead of being like David, who was confident in who he was and whose he was, they act like Moses when God called them to the ministry. And it's hard for God to understand how Moses could be that way. If you understand Moses' life, Moses grew up as a prince. Moses spent the first 40 years of his life as a prince in Egypt. He was with Pharaoh and living large and in charge. But one day he saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite and he broke the fight up and killed the Egyptian. So he had to leave Egypt and escape to Media. And the next 40 years of Moses' life, we read these words in the second part of your handout. Notice what it says in Exodus 3 and 1. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Not Moses kept his own flock, but Moses was keeping the flock of somebody else. We have people in here today that God has called you to do great things. Some of you, God has called you to own your own business. Some of you, God has called you to be leaders in your companies. But because you don't see yourself the way God sees you, Oftentimes we can act like the man who was fishing. And as he was fishing, he was throwing all the big fish back and he was keeping all the little fish. And finally a man that was watching this said, man, what are you doing? You're throwing all the big fish back and you're keeping all the little ones? He said, yes, the reason why my frying pan is too small. A what? Now think about that for a second. If you're catching big fish, what should you do? Get a big frying pan. <laughs> and you've got to realize that God has fearfully and wonderfully made you. You are born to win. You've been engineered with God's echoes. You've been endowed with God's seeds of greatness. And your plan small doesn't benefit you. It doesn't benefit your family. It doesn't benefit the kingdom of God. Because we 
that God created you to be. And here Moses is, have gone from being a prince in Egypt to where he's working for somebody else, keeping their flock. So God had to get his attention with a burning bush. I put it in your handout. You can read it on your own. Moses saw the burning bush. He turned aside to see why this bush is not burning up. Why does it continue to burn? And God would do things to get your attention when he calls you. But the question is, when God calls, how do you come? There are three basic ways that people come when God calls them. You got some people, they come in a rowboat. They got to be pushed. You ever had somebody that you had to push them every step of the way? You can do it. 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 And if you don't stop pushing them, they'll stop doing it. You ever had to wake up folks and get them to come to church? Come on, it's church time. You got to be in church at now. Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. You got to push them every step of the way. We got some people that come, number two, in a sailboat. They change like the wind. Whichever way the wind blows, they go. You ever seen people that, we call them bunny, hop, bunny rabbit questions. They hop over to this church one week. <laughs> then you don't see them and they hop over to this church one week. And the reason they never get it is why they're always moving. And God was saying, if you're looking for the perfect church, you're going to be looking a long time because it stopped being perfect when you join. Your job is to get in the church and help the church to become better. The Bible says the double-minded man, the double-minded woman is unstable in all their ways. We got people, I was being introduced over in Plano when the mayor of Plano said to me, I'm going to be like Elizabeth Taylor told her last husband, I'm not going to keep you long. Introducing our speaker, James Parker. Now, if you know anything about Elizabeth Taylor, she had been married at the time seven times. And every time she'd get in a marriage and she'd have a problem, she'd get out of the marriage. And that's the problem with too many people who make a covenant with God. Their problem is they think they're not supposed to have any problems. That's the problem. But if you never had the problem, how are you going to learn that with God's help, you can solve them? And what you got to do is to make up your mind to not be a rowboat that has to be pushed or a sailboat that changes like the wind. God is looking for steamboats. The type of people that make up their mind and say, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. If God says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that settles it. If God says, I was created in his own image, a little lower than the angels, that settles it. If God says, I'm special, if God says, he created me unique, if God says, I'm somebody, that settles it. And when God says it, because he's not a man that can lie, He's not a man that can fail. He's not a man that can change. But most importantly, he cannot be pleased without your faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And we got to make up our mind to know that you are special. And no matter what the world says, you believe what God says. Most of us in America, we would be considered in here today what the world labels as a minority. It's nothing but a label that somebody has put on you. They say, well, James, you are a black man. I'm looking at my skin today and I don't look too black. <laughs> Because you are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
And as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, no person can make you feel inferior without your permission. It's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. Zig Ziglar tells a story about a man who was 330 pounds. His name was Dave. And one day he was in one of our seminars and Zig was letting him know that you were born to win, man. You were created in God's own image and he finally got it from his head down to his heart. And the next day he was in a grocery store and a little boy looked at his mom and said, ooh, mama, look at that fat man. And Dave said, I turned around to see who he was talking about. And he said he laughed so hard then he began to cry because finally he got it in his heart and he didn't see a fat man in the mirror and he began to change. When you change your thoughts, you change your world. But no person, as Joyce Brothers would say, can consistently perform in a manner inconsistent with the way that they see themselves. You are not who you think you are. You are who you think you are. I pray that everybody gets that in your spirit today. Not what your head says, it's what your heart says and what God says. David got it, Moses didn't get it. So you read the story, God came to him in the burning bush, God told him to take off his shoes, you're standing on holy ground, and, and God told Moses, he says, I've got a task for you. I've heard the cries of the children of Israel. They got taskmasters, Pharaoh is mistreating them, they're in slavery, and I've called you to be the one that's going to deliver them. I've got an bowl for you. Go down to verse number 11, when Moses responded to what God says. And Moses said to God, what? Who? am I that I should go to Pharaoh that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt see Moses didn't see himself the way God saw him Moses saw himself the way other people and he saw himself and if you don't get a revelation on who you are and whose you are. You will be like so many people that go to the grave with their best gifts still unwrapped. Their best talents still unused. It's natural for people when God calls them to feel unworthy. When he called Jeremiah, Jeremiah said, I'm just a child. When he called Isaiah, Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. He knew who he was. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 17, if any man or woman be in Christ, we are what? New creatures. The former things have passed away. And the key word in that whole sentence says, Behold, all things are new. And we got people that read it every day, but they'll never get to the point to where they behold it. Because when you behold it, it'll make a difference in your life. Because you truly understand that you are a child of God. Born to win, engineered with evidence and endowed with God's seeds of greatness. So Moses says, who am I? And then God says to him, certainly I will be with you. That should have been enough. God said, I got you, Moses. I got you back. I don't need your ability. I just need your availability. I could have chosen anybody, but I chose you. All you got to do is to do what I tell you to do. Aren't you glad Mary got it? When the angel came to her when she was a little teenager and said, you are highly favored. You have been chosen by God. You are going to be the mother of Christ. And Mary got to thinking she was still a virgin. She got to thinking, I mean, 
engaged to this man, and I know he's going to go crazy when he find out I'm pregnant. But Mary had enough trust and faith in God. It didn't take the angel long to get it through. She just said, be it unto me according to your word. In other words, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. But the reality, y'all, when God said it, it's already settled whether we believe it or not. And we need to understand that us dumbing down, acting like we're not created in God's own image, it doesn't serve the world. And God sees too many people that struggle trying to fit in instead of being the great person that he has designed for us to be. So Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God says, tell him I am sent you. In other words, I am who I am. I don't answer to Pharaoh and I don't answer to anybody else. Pharaoh answers to me. And all you've got to do is to understand you have a father that loves you so much that he gave his son's life to save your life. And that should motivate all of us to be everything that God gave his life for us to be. And finally, after convincing, Moses did what God told him to be. So why should I think I'm special? The S in special. Say with me, God saved me. God saved me. I tell a story in my book, Where Do You Stand? Wonderful book. It's become a top seller. I pray that those who have a copy were blessed with it. But the point I'm making with this, there's a story in the book about a, a boy who befriended a, a juvenile delinquent. And, and, and they were on a boat fishing with his dad. And, and when they were on this boat fishing with his dad, one day the, the winds came by and blew and the boat turned over. And the father only had one life preserved. And the father had the life preserver in his hand and he looked at both of the boys that were about to drown. He looked at his own son and says, I love you more than words can speak, more than my thoughts can think, more than my feelings can feel. I love you, son, with all my heart. And he looked at the other delinquent child and he threw the life preserver over and saved that child and let his own son die. I've talked to a lot of parents. I haven't heard one parent. I say, who in here today would let your own son die to save another delinquent child? Not one has said I would. But do you realize that's exactly what the father did when he let Jesus die in your place? Do you have a revelation of what Jesus did for you? The father let him die so that you could live. See, the father knew that if Jesus died, he was going to be with the father in heaven to live as Christ, but to die is gain. To be absent in the body means we're present with the Lord. But if you would have died and you not would have received salvation, you would have not been with the father in eternity. That's how much God loves you. That's how special God thinks you are. That he would let Jesus die for you to live. The P in special. Somebody say God purposed you. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter, before you were even a thought, in your mother's womb, God knew you. He ordained you for his purpose. He has a plan for your life. You're not an accident. God selected you and he expects you to fulfill 
that purpose. We have people in here today that God has called you to ministry, but the world has said, you can't be in ministry. What about your past? God wants you to know that it's not your past. It's your future that you need to be focusing on. Do you know if you listen to the world that Moses was a murderer? But God had a plan for his life. Peter did not even knowing Jesus three times. But yet he became one of the top apostles in the Bible. The apostle Paul held the coats when they stoned Stephen. He called himself the chief of sinners. But yet and still, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, all because he got a revelation not only of who he was, but whose he was. And God wants you to know that every saint has a past, but every sinner who gets saved by grace has a great future in Christ Jesus. And you don't let nobody stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Amen. Paul said, I'm persuaded that nothing shall separate me from the love of God. People can talk about me all they want. They can put labels on me all they want. But when you know who you are and whose you are, it just rolls off your back like what? On a duck's back. And you don't let nobody criticize and condemn you or label you and stop you from being the child of God that he made you to be. E, God exempted you. The Bible tells us in Psalms 103 that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions. You got to get a revelation of this. And what basically that whole chapter is talking about, God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. God is not mad at you. You may be God is making a difference for you. God is not mad at you when he sends you through trials and tribulations. God is making a disciple out of you. And we have to get a revelation how much God loves us. Instead of thinking that he's some God that's going around trying to catch you doing what's wrong. He loves you. And he has exempted you. Do you know that we are the righteousness of God? by grace. And when God shared this with me, Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. And Jesus came back and, and, and God was showing me how it was when, when Peter saw Jesus the first time after he rose again. Peter walking up to Jesus, oh Jesus, I'm so sorry. Oh, I, I know I said I never was going to deny you, but I denied you three times and I just feel so unworthy. And you know what Jesus was saying to Peter? Peter, what are you talking about? What are you talking about, Peter? In other words, he's already thrown that in the sea of forgiveness. God has already forgiven you for the things that you've done in your past. But you know what the problem is? We have a hard time forgiving ourselves. And the devil doesn't have any power until he puts the thought in your head and you cast it down. You start to believe what he says instead of what God has said. And whenever the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Somebody say he's a defeated foe. He is a To see and special. Thank God that we have a God that chose us. When you understand that you have been chosen by God before the world began, 
It helps you to realize who you are and whose you are. Do you know if we have twins in here today, no twin has the same thumbprint, fingerprint. God knows the number of hers on your head. That's how special you are to him. All that girl. <laughs> but he chose us before the world began. And it should help us to be all that we can be for Christ. And God challenges you today to get a revelation of who you are and whose you are. One of my favorite stories is on Supreme Court Judge Oliver Wendell Holmes. A man wanted to meet him all of his life. But when he finally met this Supreme Court George, he never realized he was so short. And this man goes, man, I wanted to meet you all my life. I've heard all the great things you, 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 you can, but how do you feel being so short? You're almost a dwarf. You're almost a midget. How do you feel being such a short man? And you know what I don't know what said to him? Oh, I feel like a dime next to a penny. Because where I come from, we don't measure people by how tall or short they are. We measure them by the content of their character. Have you ever seen somebody that may be short of stature and they get these shoes and they're almost like they're walking on stilts. They're trying to be tall. <laughs> Instead of just loving yourself for who you are. There's somebody out there that will love you just the way that you are. There's somebody that will love you without a breast implant. There's somebody out there that will love you without a butt implant. There's Transforms 
into steam. And with steam, you can take a ship around the world. With steam, you can take a train across the country. And God says, I created you to be steam, not lukewarm. Lastly, as I come to a close, somebody say with me, God loves me. And he loves you with all of his heart. And his heart's desire for us today to know how special we are. The Bible says that you and I are loved with an everlasting love by God. He loves us and there ain't nothing we can do about it. Sometimes he loves us with a love that makes him glad. Sometimes with a love that makes him sad. But he loves you anyhow. And he wants you to experience that love. I close by saying God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son, his only child that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. And when you know who you are and whose you are, when you know God thinks you special, it does not matter what man thinks. Because you get yourself worth from God. You get your self-esteem, how you see yourself from God. You get your self-image, how you view yourself from God. You don't have to go around young girls with hardly no clothes on trying to impress people at school when you know who you are and whose you are. You ain't got to go around trying to cover your hair on the color of a rainbow to get some attention when you know who you are and who's you are. You ain't got to go around with a big ring in your nose at school <laughs> trying to fit in with the crowd when you know who you are and whose you are. If you can receive it, give God praise and I'll close out right there. God bless you today. Thank you.